you know, Kapano, what you were saying about dialogue. Um, about eight months ago, some of my colleagues and I, and that included Kapano and Sandy, we took our seats in an intimate but somewhat uneasy space, familiar but unfamiliar space, to do a couple of things, but largely to reflexively engage with, to problematize and question what I refer to as our oppositional sense of selves and our oppositional frameworks of reference and practices. And here I'm using the word oppositional very much as an idea that has emerged from feminist and decolonial thought about uh, activity in the service of social and gender justice. So this was at a conceptualization and strategic planning meeting of the Transdisciplinary African Psychologies Program that Kobano leads. Um, and the agenda item read as follows, working through meanings of who I am, who we are in relation to Africa. I read this intervention in the wake of the decolonial um, turn um, in, in psychology, and in particular, Copano's efforts to privilege um, and to center African psychologies. I also understood this process as an attempt at a paradigm shift that um, brought into focus alternative ways of understanding ourselves and understanding each other and to rethink, to think and to rethink not only issues of identity but very much issues related to location, to, um, uh, to space, uh, uh, to ethics, to knowledge making. Um, I also saw our dialogue as not disconnected to the crit critiques that even as critically engaged um, researchers in our case, that we don't sufficiently pay attention to, um, to the knowledges that we make within the context of a, uh, the university as a colonizing and capitalist institution, which obviously gives rise to the forms of knowledge in very particular ways in, and in ways that reproduce gender and racialized um, hierarchies. Well, it turned out to be a very instructive process at many levels and in many ways. Our dialogue took on the rhythm of Yes, taking on this task of reflexivity in ways that, was, that were very cooperative, but also we resisted it and we interrupted re, uh, reflexivity. We perf performed identity work in ways that were immediately fathomable, making proclamations of, uh, you know, I am, I am. But also so layered that um, familiar frames of reference for understanding who we are and others social, spatially, um, as well as in terms of ways of being in the world was not instantly accessible to us. We retreated into the conventions that we, the very conventions that we sought to critique, even as we broke them. So I don't know how typical this is in psychology of a group of, a collective of psychologists coming together to do this kind of work. And we relied on the traditional, let's sit in a circle and talk about this modality, while at the same time we were trying to do something quite different that, uh, you know, the centering of reflexivity in an alternative way. We used our critical stance to broaden and deepen our conversations and our engagements with each other, but also to shut them down, especially to shut them down when we thought that what was playing out in the circle was very much a, a, a dominant form of psychology. I experienced this, an, uh, this encounter as somewhat uncomfortable, confusing, initially confusing, very disorderly and restricted. It stopped almost before it started. But I've since come to see it as a very legitimate moment towards emancipatory praxis in the, psych in the psychologies that we are talking about here today. So I don't know if this is how, this is how you thought about it, but but this is the meaning I have come to ascribe to it since. There's much more that I could say about this moment, but that's not really what I want to talk about today. I want to use it as a reference, um, largely to talk about reflexi reflexivity as epistemic justice, rather than merely epistemic practice, and what this means for African psychologies. So reflexivity as an ethical imperative, as a conceptualization that extends beyond the current framing of reflexivity largely as a methodolo methodological tool in um, qualitative research. And in making a case for working towards more critical ideas and enactments of reflexivity, what we suggest is a reconsideration of our reference um, for knowing and being alongside the imperatives for African psychologies and Africa and psychology that 
Copano, um, Sandy, and Aziswa have been talking about. So first, a, very, uh, a few very brief comments about reflexivity, but especially about the critiques leveled against it. Um, let me see if I can juggle. I'm, I'm really not going to go into this, but there have been many typologies that have been offered on reflexivity, the more critical of which have emerged from feminist and race-based work. This notion of reflexivity has actually come under fire um, with some pretty scathing criticism directed at it, particularly in discussions about the politics of the gays. The aggregate concern here is that paradoxic paradoxically, reflexivity may be transformed into an unethical practice um, of mere inward gazing that produces accounts of reflexivity rather than truly reflexive accounts. And the problems here are many. For example, the rhetorical functions of reflexivity, which uh, can and in fact disguise some of our work or, or lay claims to uh, authority and credibility in particular ways, that it offers the new technology of subjectivity that educates our emotion and normalizes some while pathologizing or silencing others. Then there are the dangers of researchers such as ourselves getting, in lost, getting lost in endless, self-indulgent, narcissistic, and rather tiresome personal emoting and catharsis and deconstructions of deconstructions of deconstructions where all meanings get lost. The covert recentering and reinscribing of this integrated, reflecting subject, which actually is quite reminiscent of precisely the so-called rational subject of modern science that, that, we, um, that we critique. Then, of course, the co-option of reflexivi reflexivity by neoliberalism for its subversion and its return to an ethic of individualization, individualism. Um, then engaging the problems of, of, let me just go to the next slide. Engaging the problems of representation is really a very privileged space from which to work. Um, the danger that we end up working on ourselves as the site of change in research and that the idea that reflexivity is, is almost an end point. So the feminist scholar Deborah Pat, uh, Daphne Patai, um, this is what she said. And she went on to ask if reflexivity actually produces better research. We could ask, does it really change how we do psychologies on the continent? So reflexivity clearly has its limits, and um, we've talked about this as much as we have um, produced and, and, and enacted um, reflexivities in some of the problematic ways that I've, I've just mentioned. But we note that reflexivity remains under-theorized in relation to African psychologies. We suggest returning from the micropolitics of our research encounters to asking a new or possibly different set of meta-reflexive questions, such as, what does, do I have it here? Maybe. What does this critique of the knowing subject in psychology, which is typically white, male, Euro-American, and dispassionate, exactly involve? And does it sufficiently reference the, the particular epistemic struggles and projects of African psychologies? What does all of this really mean for our knowledges and practices? And what are the ultimate ethical implications for psychology on the African continent? Are we and or how are we deploying reflexivity as an epistemic praxis of transformatory potential in African psychologies, in other words, epistemic justice? So while thinking about reflexivity in relation to the analyse, analyses of the political economy of knowledge uh, production, I mean, that's very much what has happened through the critical turn in psychology, certainly. Um, again, let me say, we, we're wondering whether its theorization as it stands is sufficient in terms of the questions that we have to ask within African psychologies. Um, and we're suggesting the expansion of boundaries which requires us to do very particular kind of intellectual work, but I think also very particular kinds of emotional labor um, to, to engage these questions, very much as we attempted to do in the, in the talking circle that I, I referred to earlier. So in looking at the psychology literature on the subject, 
one can't help but, but notice that work on reflexivity largely tends to reproduce the one epistemological size-fits-all standpoint of uh, North-centric scholarship and very much discounts um, its, its irredu irreducibility um, of, of the ethical dimension, which typically gets talk about, talked about uh, in reference to protocols we do and submit to ethics committees. So it's this that concerns us as we think about African psychologies as an epistemological site from which we reorganize knowledge forms and processes. Critically, reflexivity, not merely as a confessional recounting of, which we're saying renders it incomplete and, and, and very much uh, inadequate, but as an ethical accounting for, for what we teach, what we practice, what we research and write about, how we do this, how we engage with each other, and so forth. Now in much of the literature, the ethical dimension of reflexivity in the way that I'm talking about it um, is really referenced. Um, and the way we're talking about it to remind you is a locating and doing that is not compatible, very clearly not compatible, with the vocabularies and the registers of mainstream psychologies, um, as expressed in, you know, in the interrogations about who produces knowledge, where it's produced, how it's produced, and so forth. So it talks to an ethic, it also talks to an ethic of academic life. And this ethic encourages the enabling uh, practice of a plural and relational knowledge politics that has far less to do with the individualized will to intellectual power, the need to have grand intellectual heroes in our midst, and much to do with different ways of knowing and being, our confrontation with the makings of the discipline as we know it, and what this means for the relationship between science and society, which obviously includes engagements and interactions uh, between us in the discipline. This ethical reflexive project also advances intellectual humility, tolerance, and respect. So, moving away from the one-size-fits-all idea, we suggest that this ethical reflexive praxis in African psychologies may benefit from Linda Tui Smith's um, conceptualization of the five conditional frameworks necessary for decolonization to begin. She, remember, she's written the book on decolonizing methodologies. I think I've... So this may translate into exploring different kinds of spaces that are multi-voiced and socially and ethically accountable. It may translate into alternative modes of engagement that adopt vocabularies, mappings, and methodological tools or methodologies, really, that enable us to expand and deepen our conversations and our relationships. Um, it might translate into different theories of change, um, engaging with the contested and very complex framings of identity, and thinking about the, how the forms of psychology to which we subscribe ultimately support the life-supporting priorities, the life-supporting priorities of the continent. It also implies ambiguity, not knowing, really not knowing, um, even feeling vulnerable, and our own limitations and, and conditions. I'm sure there are many more uh, other factors that would, would, be, uh, would be relevant here. In many ways, the reflexive dialogue among my colleagues and I, both knowingly and unknowingly, was predicated on these conditional frameworks and their constituents, when I think about it now. Having said all of this, let me state this. This is not the end point that has to be negotiated by us. Rather, it is a point of departure, uh, struggle, and critique. We are increasingly functioning within a knowledge economy that compels us to engage within systems of competition and hierarchy, where individual progress is what's privileged and what's rewarded, and only certain kinds of knowledges and ways of knowing are considered as legitimate. 
So the adoption of this kind of praxis very clearly strains against this neoliberally constructed knowledge economy. Can we do this? Can we take the risks implied to do this? I don't know. I don't know. I can only answer this for myself, but I feel strongly that mobilizing towards an African psychologies movement that renders ourselves and our contributions more visible, more brazen, as I said, perhaps even more vulnerable, um, as we navigate this project together is really what we should commit to. Thank you.